Pakistan. And when we talk of an ongoing dispute, we talk of religion or we talk of So, in our part of the world, when we talk of disputes, we talk of religion, or we talk of politics, or we talk of geopolitics. But we very seldom talk about wars breaking out for reasons other than these three, especially in South Asia. That has been our history. So, this book is remarkable for the fact that it makes no mention of Pakistan, and it makes no mention of religion either two very refreshing things uh, in our part of the world. But I leave it to the author to tell you more about the book. But because this is not just a book discussion, but also a book launch, I think we should first unveil your book. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, for those of us in this audience who may not have read uh, the book, uh, why don't we just start with you telling the audience very briefly what the book is about? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, if you don't mind, I'll stand up because it's getting more too static otherwise. Um, Radius 200, can you hear me at the back? Radius 200 is about love and longing and the celebration of the capacity of the human spirit to survive all odds, all odds. It is the year 2040. There is a growing restlessness among the Indian army. The geopolitical uh, the politico-military relationship in India is almost at another. And there is a simmering discontent among the uniformed. I'll just like to illustrate that. There are two generals talking to each other, and one just bursts out, let's fly. He's letting out his frustration. He says, human beings, who? Those bloody politicians who have neither the brains to understand military strategy, nor the balls to stand up and claim our rights, who nullify every hard-earned victory of ours. I want to know who gave these bungling bloody politicos the right to frit away the, the our labor on a damn negotiating table. The disastrous results are for everyone to see. So much of our land illegally occupied. POK with Pakistan, Aksai Chin and Shakskam Valley with China, all gone. The northern head of India is slowly becoming triangular. But chalta hai. Why? Nahi chalta hai, yaar. Bullshit. It is the year 2040. India is going through an acute water situation. At the same time, China is building the world's largest dam on the river Brahmaputra to divert the waters to its own land. And this dam is coming up at Medog, which is just 30 kilometers from the, the Indochina border. <clears throat> this general refuses to take what he calls a bloody shit. He says, right there, let's deliver a knockout blow. 
One of the most important principles of defense, gentlemen, deny the enemy what he is cherishing. So, let's blow up the Yalong Sangpo Dam, shall we? Okay. In the Indian Army, in any army for that matter, obeying a senior's command is sacrosanct. A junior's it is the junior's role, it's, it's a default mode for the junior to obey a senior's command. And senior officers are forever drilling it into the junior's mind. Meaning, I'm, I may not be God, but I'm no less than God. Lieutenant Colonel Om Prakash is faced with a terrible dilemma. To obey a general whom he hero worships, or to listen to the naggings of his own rational mind. With total disregard to the wishes of his superiors, General Fernandez had taken a unilateral decision. A thrill ran down own spine. Of such stuff are heroes made. Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson. I really do not see the signal he had said. Known for bold action and a disregard for orders from his superiors, Nelson had placed a telescope to his blind eye so that he could not see the signal from his superiors, asking him to disengage. He had demolished the Danish Navy at Copenhagen. Today, he was a national icon for Britain. Insubordination or flamboyant heroism History tended to think the latter. Okay. Um, this dilemma that Colonel Om Prakash is going through, he thinks to himself, must a junior obey a command he knows would most certainly bring disaster upon his country? When your nation's very existence could be jeopardized by one command, was it not incumbent upon a junior officer to exercise his own judgment? Okay, so much for the army and its officers. <clears throat> when nations clash, the biggest casualty is love. It's always love that suffers. General Fernandez's unilateral decision triggers an automatic triggers an immediate retaliatory action by China, which follows it up with a nuclear attack on northern India. A huge area, 200 kilometers in radius, is declared an exclusion zone. It is the year 2060. Kaira, Om Prakash's love, is living outside the zone for the last 20 years. Rain came pelting down in a cacophony of sounds the noisy rattling along the cobbled pathway in the pool area below, the sharp staccato drumming on a metal roof somewhere, softer and duller against the acrylic sheet along the balconies, all the various sounds merging into one huge, sheltering, healing canopy. Rain on her face and in her eyes, rain drenching her through and through, cool and oh so utterly blissful. Kaira opened her mouth wide, letting the rain fall on her tongue, trickle down her throat. Suddenly a flash of memory. She's a, as a child, she's walking down Cuff Parade in Mumbai, sharing a raincoat with Om. And Om runs out from under the raincoat, walking in tippy toes ahead of her. What are you doing, Kaira cried. You'll get all, shh. I'm trying to walk between the streaks of rain. Try it. No one can walk between the rain. You're crazy, Kaira said. Just memories. Inside the in the silence, inside the canopy of rain, Kaira stood absolutely still, mingling in the rain, streaking down her face were unbidden tears. All she has left are memories. Ohm's voice dogs her every strip. Traitor, me, you don't really believe that. Kaira, you can't believe that. 
She plugged her ears, buried her face in her hands. So tell me, if you are not a traitor, tell me what really happened. Where are you? She screamed at the trees, heavy with clusters of ripening mangoes, at the intoxicated buzzing bees, at the fleecy white clouds and the blue skies. Only the cows stayed back, placidly chewing cud, swishing flies with their tails. Waking, sleeping, standing still. Every moment, Om's face was before her eyes. The wide grin, the uneven teeth, the goblin ears he would sometimes wiggle at parties just to show off. Reason told her she was being absolutely foolish. It was impossible for a person to survive an air crash and a nuclear fallout. She would have laughed outright had someone told her of somebody who had done that. But her heart would not let go. Haven't you heard, it whispered slightly, sometimes facts can be stranger than fiction. So, can human beings survive nuclear holocaust? Will Kyra, living for the past 20 years, hugging hope to her breast like a hurt puppy, ever find her love? The answers are here. Thank you. Uh, Veena ji, we leave our taps running when we brush our teeth uh, in our homes, in our offices. We uh, neglect to fix our leaky taps and faucets. We assume that the water that we have is going to be with us forever. But in your book, uh, you have painted a worst case scenario of what will happen when our rivers dry up, what will happen when our dams are built indiscriminately. Uh, already dams are being built indiscriminately, already rivers are drying up. But you are looking into the future and you are telling us uh, of what can possibly happen. But what made you think of water as a resource over which nations will fight? Oh, water is absolutely essential to our everyday life. And uh, it's a known fact. Experts have been long predicting that if there is a third world war, it is going to be over water. And one of the major flashpoints is supposed to be the uh, Indochina border. Let's talk about the human cost. This novel is interesting because it talks about a, within a certain radius where the nuclear bomb falls, uh, it is a kind of a zero zone where nothing grows, nothing happens. But what happens to human life? Does it come back? Pardon, what happens? To human life. What is yeah. the human cost? Yeah, exactly. Uh, see, a, a holocaust of that nature will definitely change life the way it is. But my uh, reading was that Human nature remains the same. The, the power struggle, the loves, the jealousies, even in, a, in the exclusion zone, inside the exclusion zone, the band of small survivors, which is trying to survive, they are going through the same relationship problems, the same power struggle, the same emotions. So human nature doesn't change whether you're uh, living in extreme situations or not. See, the way I look at it, um, each one of us lives within a small circle of our own, a kind of a daira uh, within which we must operate. In fact, for a very long time, the working title of this novel was Daira. Uh, and the intersection where two circles would meet is where relationships happen. And those are areas which are most interesting. And then there are the larger circles which represent the life of nations and the life of this very earth which we live on. And what fascinates me is where individual circles intersect with the larger circles, where the larger problems are taking place, and what happens at that, in, at that intersection. Because the individuals are coming with their own, own emotional baggage, the uh, unexpressed loves or unfulfilled amb ambitions. And when this clashes with the larger issues like water, nuclear fo water scarcity, nuclear fallout, how do these relationships work out and, and what happens in these extreme situations to human relationships? That, that is what fascinated me and made me write this book. Yeah. 
There is also a love story which is at the heart of this larger story. Tell us a little about the love story between you've mentioned them in your earlier it remarks. Is a, it is the it's an unexpressed love story actually, because uh, when the uh, Holocaust happens and these two are separated, one inside the exclusion zone and one outside the exclusion zone, they have not really expressed their love to each other yet. And one of the points is that if you are in love, please express yourself because life may not always give you a second chance. All right, on that note, um, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. We have about five or seven minutes. Is there someone uh, with a mic here? <coughs> Hello, hello. Can you hear me? As far as water wars are concerned, the fact that China is building a dam on the Brahmaputra is a reality. As of today, not in 2040. And uh, that construction has already started and uh, can be viewed on satellite photographs. So the likely diversion of water, like the author has brought out, is very likely in the near future. In fact, much before 2040. Hopefully not followed by a okay. nuclear. Now, the second part is, uh, while Bollywood movies, etc., do depict police in a certain manner, when you talk of the Indian Army, of which I am also a member, there must be some sanctity of truth, realism, and methodology how the Indian Army of your country functions. While you talk of human relationships, etc., in an adverse fallout of nuclear weapons and things, you must understand how nuclear weapons function, how a tactical nuclear f weapon functions, how a strategic nuclear weapon functions, and how the command and control structure to control such weaponry is actually executed in our country. What so a, a lieutenant colonel does not deal directly with a general. You see, you must talk of the Indian Army with some sort of pragmatism if, if and If you realism. have a specific objection to her depiction of the Indian yes. Army, please come up with that. Yes, sir, I, I'm exactly talking about that. So you must have a certain, when you talk of the Indian Army, you must be brought up in an Indian Army family. You must understand how an Indian Army organization functions because bringing up things like this is no good for our country. You see, you must bring up the Indian Army in a proper manner and how it actually functions giving away so many lives on a daily basis and talking of… What is the question you have? Talking of, no, it's not a question, it's I'm a sorry, statement. Can you, can Thank you, you. That's it. It's just you, a statement. Thank you. Can you Don't get worried. Specific it's okay. Have. Anybody else? Anyone else? you might have done and uh, I'm not sure what he meant by po proper portrayal but uh, how would you like to respond? No, what was his question actually? It wasn't a question, <laughs> it was a depiction of the... Yeah, okay, actually uh, I, I didn't get exactly what specific question you were asking but I will tell you that I have gone through very detailed extensive research on two areas especially. One is the nuclear area, the nuclear attack, what kind of weapon and what kind of uh, impact it would have, have and uh, the kind of how, how you can... There is a question there, let's take that. He's the same person. No, no. no there's Pichi. Yeah. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, this is Tanya here. Yes, I think you're a very brave lady to attempt something of this nature, this topic. And I salute you for your choice of subject. And um, can you hear me, by the way? No, no, now <laughs> no? I can. Okay, okay. So I was just saying I salute you for picking this subject and for um, bringing to us this interesting story which we're all looking forward to reading. But I just wanted to know, is there anything that you yourself have experienced in your life that triggered this decision to write this kind of story. Was there a little element of uh, something that you have experienced there yourself or is it just something that has always been there in the back of your mind as uh, a person 
connected with the services. Thank you. Chandra, what is the question? What made you choose this? Is this something is the personal reason for it? No, no, there's no personal reason for it. But uh, you see, why does a writer write? A writer writes because something about the world nags him. And for a long time, these few issues have been nagging me but that uh, the rivers which we really revered are becoming nothing but glorified uh, drains. And uh, then there's a nuclear fallout, nuclear uh, buildup. Nobody seems to talk about it. And it is, nobody thinks that there could be a clear and present danger that somebody in power could press the button. So no, and nobody wants to talk about it. It's just like an ostrich. We want to hide our, uh, hide this fact. And also it nags me that in India, we are going through a phase where there is discontentment, a simmering kind of a discontentment in the armed forces. And the political military relationships are not really at the very best. So these three things nagging me when something when a writer, some, some things like this nag the writer, he sort of just erupts into writing. And I think that's what happened to me. I don't know if this answers your question. One last very quick question, uh, if somebody has it. I'm the author's husband, and I'm from the armed forces. The book has been vetted by three army generals. Oh my god. My god. And they have really lauded the book. So anybody's objection that the army was not consulted by the author, it may be taken as uh, no objection at all. Because three army retired generals have vetted the. Thank you. Is there a question? No. Yes. OK. Just observation. Okay. Thank you, sir, for that vote of confidence. Uh, but any, any last thought, question, and then we'll wrap up the session. I'm very happy that you touched on this topic. Thank but you. But the only thing is, uh, what inspired you to? It is just your, and at what age was it troubling you that you picked up this topic? What was troubling you to pick up this? What was troubling me? I just explained what was troubling me about these Achha, things. That's what you wrote about. No, no, at what age did you get that feeling that you want to write a book on this topic? Oops, I can't uh, understand this. Question. What age did you decide? What age? What age did I decide? About what? What age? When did you decide to write it? Oh, when did I decide to Yes, yes. When that, did I decide yes, to write yes, it? Yes, You are asking me my age? No, no, not your age. <laughs> no, so, I can tell you my age. No, no, no. At <laughs> what time, at what age did you think of writing them? I, uh, this book was conceived about two, three years ago. That's what I want. Yeah, two, three years ago, and that much time it has. Actually, I have this very funny way of writing that even when I finish a book, I sort of put it in the deepest recesses of my drawers and let it lie there for at least six months, minimum six months. Because when I come back to it, I find, when I come back to the rewriting process, I find that I can see things very much more clearly. It's what can, what has to be, the wheat from the chaff becomes much clearer. So that's the way I write it. So even after I finish, I put it aside for some time. And uh, so the age, if you want to know. <laughs> no, I'll tell you my age. In my heart, about 18. In my mind, about 35. In my body, I've crossed 75. You decide my age. <laughs> Thank you. More power, more power to your pen. May you continue to write. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, there's some. Who is that little boy who wants to ask something? Can we ask that little boy to okay. ask something? Yes. Okay. Why did you name this book Radius 200? The title. Huh? 
What is the significance of the title? Significance of the title. I just explained the significance of the title. When a nuclear attack takes place, uh, if you know anything about Chernobyl in, uh, in Russia, when a nuclear fallout takes place either due to accident or due to an attack, a large area is declared as an exclusion zone. That means nobody can enter and nobody can come out of it. When the attack takes place, there, uh, there is provision made to uh, evacuate people, but that is within a limited period of time. After that period of time, that is an exclusion zone. Now, in Chernobyl, for example, what happened was that there, are certain, there were certain people who refused to come out of the uh, exclusion zone. And uh, in fact, they, they, uh, they are called babushkas, the Russian name for grandma, because babushka, these babushkas stayed there and survived. So nature perhaps tends to rejuvenate. It's, it's a very scary thing what happens at a nuclear fallout, but perhaps nature starts tending to take over over a period of time. Does that answer your question? Uh, the radi radius 200, why the title? Because the exclusion zone was in a circle which had a radius of 200 kilometers. 200 kilometers, okay? Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. We wish to thank Weena Nagpal and Rakshanda Jalil.